we're, we're going to close our, our with comments from Kenji Hakuta, and uh, we're, we're trusting that Pedro Noguera will be um, with us. Uh, and then following that, we're going to be hearing from the professor and and then uh, uh, in closing from uh, Eva, who's going to uh, wrap things up for us and, and look ahead to the uh, future. So we're going to start by um, uh, having uh, Kenji present to us. And because this um, a meeting is going to be seen in the future by persons who who uh, may not be familiar with uh, with our um, our closing speakers, I'm going to do a very brief introduction. Uh, so for the record, uh, folks can appreciate it. I should say it's important to appreciate that both uh, Pedro Noguera and Kenji Hokuta are products of the historical process that has been associated with higher education research and leadership in national research efforts towards social justice and equity in education that itself is a marker of the accomplishments of, of the traditions associated with the professor and the advocacy for civil rights. So at one point, Eve and I were thinking about a special session uh, of having uh, leaders in education uh, describe how they emerge from the, their their uh, connections to the civil rights movement, social justice movement, as a product itself of our education system that has buttressed, buttressed the kinds of advocacy that um, the professors uh, led us to. So I'll uh, first mention Kenji's background. Ken Kenji is the Lee Jacks Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford. An experimental psychologist by training, he is best known for his work in the areas of bilingualism and acquisition uh, in uh, immigrant and students. He chaired a National Academy of Sciences report, Improving Schooling for Language uh, Minority Children, and he has co-edited a book on affirmative action in higher education, compelling interest, examining the evidence on racial dynamics in higher education, so apropos to the moment with the SCOTUS activity. Ken Kenji has also been an active in educational policy. He's testified to Congress and other public bodies on a variety of topics, including language policy, the education of lang language minority students, affirmative action in higher education, and improvement of quality in educational research. He was a fellow of, at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, uh, is an elected member of the National Academy of Education, fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of, of Science, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Professor Hakuta is a longstanding acquaintance of Professor Gordon and chronicler of his historical contributions to education equity and their roots in the liberatory movement of Black Americans and people of color leading to the civil rights movement in, in America. It is thus appropriate that we call upon Kenji to offer comments to contribute to the formal end of the formal portion of our proceedings today. Kenji. Thank you, uh, Richard. And um, in 1979, I uh, was a freshly minted uh, assistant professor of psychology at Yale University, uh, working, coming out of a program at, at Harvard uh, in, in, in kind of purely in, in the sort of uh, academic domain of, of, of psycholinguistics, interested in bilingualism, uh, but not knowing anything about education. And if I had been in a psychology department that did not have Edmund Gordon as a senior professor, I probably would not have gone into education because psychology departments are quite averse to uh, <clears throat> to engaging with, with problems of, of education. Uh, and so uh, it, it really is quite meaningful to me that, uh, that there was a, a senior uh, professor who seemed very uh, senior to me. Um, I realized that uh, today he would have been about 15 years younger than I am today, uh, but he certainly looked like uh, a senior uh, uh, professor that I should uh, uh, model myself after. And uh, so I, I give everything that I've done in the field of education, I, I credit to uh, what I, the, the sort of fork in the road that, uh, that the professor uh, uh, encouraged me to take. 
<clears throat> so I, I wanted to make a few comments about sort of mainly focused on some conversations that he and I have been having the last few years that are more somewhat reflective uh, in, in nature. Um, and so that's kind of what I was basing my rem remarks on today. Um, a hallmark of Edmund Gordon's life service has been to continually remind the community and scholars of human learning that their moral obligation is the promotion of intellective enlightenment through the affirmation of humanistic principles grounded in historical and cultural context. I would also underscore the encouragement of a diversity of perspectives uh, and uh, sessions that uh, uh, that we've had during this conference, including approaches to the cultural context and affirmative pedagogies, as well as attention to uh, instructional uh, practices and trying to relate uh, assessment uh, practices to instruction. You know, all of that is is very much uh, is his legacy, <laughs> and uh, in broad strokes, that's kind of been the the. the Characteristic of uh, uh, that's permeated this this uh, these last two days. Uh, what I'd like to share as we close out this conference are observations that satisfy my own personal curiosity about the sources of the professor's intellective life. From what well does he draw his inspiration and ideas? Where do Gordon's thoughts come from? That may provide a very good basis to think as we come to the end of the conference about where do we go from here. In making these remarks, I draw on what he has written about his own development in a three-volume memoir, Pedagogical Imaginations, that's been referred to in several of the, of the conversations earlier. I also draw upon a set of regularly scheduled conversations that I had with him over Zoom in the past few years while planning and reviewing the events celebrating his centennial in which many of you have already participated. I'd like to begin by remarking that the colors on Gordon's intellective palette are many, and they vary in hue. Always in the background is family, beginning with his father, Edmund Taylor Gordon, physician, uh, and his mother, Mabel Ellison Gordon, a homemaker and elementary school teacher. And Eric uh, Tucker spoke uh, eloquently about, uh, about some of that, uh, that family uh, history. Um, I also will note that the, on this slide, you'll see a photo that I, uh, of, of us in, uh, this was about four years ago, um, and in the background is a, uh, is a portrait of, of uh, Dr. Gordon and his, uh, his wife, uh, Susan, and that's such an important factor as, as, as uh, has been uh, already talked about in, uh, in understanding the, the source and inspiration uh, for his work. Uh, as Dr. Gordon relates, quote, both, that is referring to his parents, identified with the notion concerning the responsibility of the privileged to protect the less advantaged. My mother, like my father, had come from a family of affluent, college-educated Black people just two decades post-emancipation. If I had not become an educated person and done something with my life, I would have had some explaining to do. They instilled in him the value that the privileged in life have to help those with lesser resources. In addition to family, the palette includes W.E.B. Du Bois, Howard Thurman, Alan Locke, Doxy Wilkerson, the artist Charles White, and many others. Each of these figures in his life merits an essay on his own, his or her own right. As we protégés, admirers, and friends gather to celebrate the professor, these intellectual towers, and many more, would be included in his early intellective landscape. The relationship with Doxy Wilkerson, and maybe you could advance it to the next slide, which should have a picture of Wilkerson, uh, is an example with which to start. Gordon first met Wilkerson, then an associate professor at Howard, when he was a 17-year-old student. He readily admits that his time at Howard as a student started poorly, not having been adequately prepared for the demands of elite higher education scholarship. Wilkerson, along with Alan Locke, 
The second black PhD from Harvard after Du Bois made certain that this clearly brilliant yet intellectually unguided Gordon found proper orientation. As Gordon reflects about Doxy, it was Doxy who helped me come to understand that education not so much about indoctrination and the transfer of knowledge as it is about the development of the human intellect, he wrote in his memoir. This must have been strong potion for the impressionable young Gordon, especially when combined with yet another impressive professor, Alan Locke, next slide, who as Gordon recounts, oh, I'm sorry, I guess not, um, that's okay. Uh, um, this is the voice, uh, but uh, as Gordon recounts, thought that I was not reading enough, deeply enough, widely enough, not thinking about what I had read. Whenever the professor talks about the distinction between knowledge and understanding, these were his origins. Um, there's Locke. Uh, and um, I should say in terms of reading broadly, uh, in, in my, uh, I, I had the privilege of, of visiting uh, uh, Dr. Gordon recently. And as we were talking, I was looking through his bookshelf uh, and the range of books that he reads from history of science, physics, uh, oh, it's just remarkable. And, uh, and I, I, I just, uh, it, it inspires me to read more broadly than, than, than I do. Um, but that, that I, I think uh, that, that quality um, uh, he, he drew from, uh, from Locke. Quite a bit of our conversational time is also revolved around the next slide, around the gravitational energy of, oh, I'm sorry, uh, before that, the one back to, I had those orders, thank you, uh, uh, of Du Bois. While Gordon appreciated Du Bois since imprinting on a copy of Black Reconstruction that sat on its father's bookshelf, they did not meet until the 1950s when Du Bois was in the final stages of his career and Gordon was just getting started. As Gordon described their many engagements, Dr. Du Bois did most of the talking and Gordon did the listening. He could start talking about a topic like coffee production, he would say, and go on to talk about what constitutes quality, where and how it is grown, provide a deep political economic analysis of the world order. He told me about his observation that Du Bois and Alan Locke were two of the most self-confidently brilliant people he had known. Locke saw himself as above everyone else with the possible exception of Du Bois. This view was not reciprocated by Du Bois, who thought of himself as above everyone, including Karl Marx. Clearly, lack of humility was not a feature that Gordon absorbed from his two heroes. My own thought is how unlike each other they were in terms of personality. Yet from Du Bois came Gordon's push for perspective his moral obligation to act on understandings, and his sense that society must do all it can to promote the true higher learning for all. The emphasis on scholarship rather than skills is of course underscored in Du Bois's famous conflict with Booker T. Washington's approach to the Tuskegee Institute focused simply on economic self-help for black citizenry. And now let me turn to a consideration of how the professor came to his commitment to educational assessment in the service of learning, a topic that arises in just about every conversation today in which he engages. His passion for using assessment for learning, where did that come from? In her opening remarks, Linda Darling Hammond uh, stole already stole my thunder. The name Elsie Hauserman may not be an everyday reference today, and maybe next slide, I just could never find a picture of Elsa ha Hauserman, but this is this is kind of the the antichrist in <laughs> in the thinking here uh, is so th this is the 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 thing we all like to to um, uh, to to to, to uh, argue against. Uh, but um, she was Gordon's clinical supervisor in one of his first jobs in New York. She was head of education services for developmentally challenged children. Her focus was evaluation for developmental po potential in young children. Gordon refers to her influence in conversations repeatedly as the guide who led him into educational psychology. 
She told him that she did not need to know their IQ test scores, which was his official job. Uh, and then she said, I need help with understanding how they solve problems. She was interested in the human adaptive capacity and saw assessment as the measurement of function rather than the measurement of status. Now, let me turn to the philosophical and theological dimension in Gordon's broad vision, deriving principally from his relationship with the man on the next slide, Howard Thurman, the third pillar of support while he was a student at Howard. Locke and Wilkerson helped model scholarship for a young man adrift. Thurman came in when Gordon continued past his degree in zoology in 1942 and subsequently studied social ethics in divinity school, during which time he served as head usher at Rankin Chapel and then took the position as assistant dean of men. During this time, Gordon writes, under Thurman's influence, I came to recognize that the ideal minister was not so much a believer as a searcher for meaning, not so much as an evangelist as a scholar, not so much a proselytizer of the faith as an exemplar of humanistic moral values and human service, not so much the anointed and celebrated leader as the servant leader and anointer. Gordon had brilliant mentors at Howard, over our conversations, we've repeatedly raised the star power of Howard University of those days. President Mordecai Johnson worked in an era when no Black scholars were hired in the prestigious white universities. And Johnson really rode that advantage and recruited them all to Howard. These conversations with the professor helped me help add meaning for me in my own effort to understand how even into the 1940s, the boys passionately argued for getting equitable research resources to HBCUs to build their capacity to recruit top scholars. And the professor and I, in one of our recent conversations, were talking about the source of ideas in a generic sense, almost in a late night bull session in a college dormitory kind of conversation. I referenced a wall panel painting that sits on the mezzanine landing of the Keck building of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, knowing that he had been to many meetings there. And uh, many of you have been there. Um, and it's on the landing uh, area where you stand out when, when you're thinking about going somewhere between coffee and the bathroom. And uh, anyway, there's the, there's the painting. Um, it's untitled by uh, someone named Robert Van Branken and was commissioned on the occasion of the building's dedication in 2002. According to the descriptive label, it was inspired by the question, where do ideas come from? Where do they go? It's a lovely work of art depicting a fictive laboratory with instruments of measurement, notebooks, bottles of solutions. Uh, in the background, the window opens up to nature, a horizon with some trees, birds, and clouds. When I brought this up, uh, I was a bit taken aback that the professor didn't pay much attention to it. Um, but I instantly recognized why he didn't appreciate the art in relation to its intentions. Where do ideas come from? And what I thought about was his friendship uh, that he has uh, accounted to me for multiple times uh, with the artist Charles White. The artist whose work was selected by the professor for the covers of his memoir. Next slide. Uh, so there's the, the three Three books uh, on the floor there that I took a picture of. Um, it's not as good a photo as the photos of all the files on the on the floor of Mar-a-Lago, but uh, I, I pulled out his three books here. They're my books, um, and uh, and they uh, each have the, the uh, each selected uh, uh, pictures from uh, from uh, uh, from Charles White. White was a social realist who championed social justice with a focus on the hero heroism of the common folk. For volume one, using the master's tools to change the subject of the debate, the cover features move on up a little higher, a woman raising her arms, which the professor selected to urge the use of existing knowledge. Volume two, using the master's tools to inform conceptual leadership, engage scholarship and social action, is represented by Harvest Talk in which two strong sharecroppers hold scythe 
is described as symbolic of my own efforts at using the tools available to serve uh, pr productive ends for our people. So think uh, assessment in the service of learning. And volume three, defiance on becoming an agentic black male scholar is represented by General Moses and Sojourner, depicting Harry Tub Tuberman and Sojourner of Truth bearing defiant expressions. White created this drawing for the Harriet Tubman Child Health and Guidance Clinic, which the professor and Susan established in Harlem in the 1950s. Gordon drew his inspiration from humanity, a dimension unrepresented in Van Branken's work. In his memoirs, Gordon offers a chapter all, all its own to his fictive brother, Charles White. It is a beautiful conceptual eulogy. In it, he quotes from Charles White as captured in a documentary film uh, in which he's, uh, he's, uh, he appears about the relationship between his personal history and his art, almost any of it being applicable to how Gordon has conducted and conveyed, uh, conveyed his scholarship. I'll quote, and this is Charles White talking about his own work. There is a direct relationship between the contents of what I do and this personal history. Actually, I've only painted one picture in my entire life. Each one of these things are segments of a relationship. I see my totality of 300 years of Black people through one little fraction, a family, my family. Generally, when I create a head or figure, I'm thinking of the meaning behind the physical countenance of the person. I'm thinking of an expression of my own inner feeling of life. If I do a mother and a child, I use the symbol of the black mother and child. I'm thinking of all mothers, all children. I'm thinking of the meaning of love between a woman and a child. I don't try to record it, but use it symbolically to make a very broad universal statement about the search for dignity, the search for a deeper understanding of the conflict and the contradictions of life. So that there's more to it than just the illustrative portrayal of a history of a family. What I'm trying to do is talk about the history of humanity. So um, I spoke about Doxy Wilkinson earlier. I want to return to him, next slide, as I start to wrap up my portion of this session. A quote from what Gordon, the good professor, wrote about Doxy. <clears throat> he was one of the most decent human beings I've known. He was truly a gentle person. In, 30, in 55 years, I've never heard him make an unkind comment about another person. It is not that he was uncritical. He could be very critical, but he was fair. He did not tolerate gossip. His hand was always available to help someone. Sorry, lost myself. Uh, he tried to understand the transgressions of others. He sought to reconcile differences. He thought rational discourse could resolve most disputes. He believed that the human species is essentially good and under appropriate conditions, humans would deliver good. He expected the best and for many of us, he brought out the best, always by his own good example. Doxy Wilkinson lived the good life. Um, I'm gonna pause here and say, do you know anybody else who's kind of like that? Um, anyway, to that I say, Professor Gordon, that is a mirror image of who, who you are. Um, a mirror image of what you are. You've drawn on such people throughout your remarkable life and career and the collective of people around you can only be described in that way. You pointed to the importance of perspective, particularly from the underrepresented, the moral obligations of the person, developing understanding and the value of humanity and art in scholarship. You have drawn and then reciprocated and passed along good thoughts with those around you. Modeling the cultivation of variance in people around you. That is the most important role modeling that you've performed for us. Now to kind of an epilogue, and it goes back to the relationship between Gordon and Du Bois. <clears throat> when Du Bois returned to his hometown of Great Barrington, you can go to the next slide, in 1930, so to speak, to his high school alumni association, many years after he had attained world fame, his speech, much to the surprise of the audience, was about the Housatonic River, which flows through Great Barrington. Could I have the next slide, please? There's a 
picture of, of the Housatonic. Uh, since his childhood, the river had become polluted. His speech was about the state of the river. Recalling his childhood, exploring its tributaries and swimming in the river and lamenting its current state, he called for the restoration of the physical and spiritual center of the valley and for restoring its health. Um, if uh, this is Du Bois, the environmentalist, really speaking. Perhaps, uh, he keep, keeps going on, perhaps from that very freeing of spirit will come other freedom and implications and aspirations, which may be to the whole vast problem of the country life and the diffusion and diversification and enriching of culture throughout the land. So the state of the river had spiritual significance. Du Bois's boyhood home in Great Barrington, as well as the state of the Housatonic, meant so much to him, and he returned there many times well into old age. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, in one of the professor's lesser known acts, he demonstrated respect for their relationship and what Great Barrington and the river meant to Du Bois. In the 1960s, he and Susan purchased the site of the Du Bois home and worked with the local community to establish it as a national historic site, creating a beautiful wooded walk with interpretive signs leading to the remaining foundation and hearth of the Du Bois boyhood home. Gordon was thus able to honor where Du Bois drew many of his thoughts and inspirations. If you could just put on the next and last slide here. Uh, this is, um, I, if, for those of you who have not seen it, I encourage you to go to uh, the, the dedication of, there's a little documentary on the dedication of the Du Bois uh, boyhood uh, home site uh, in the UMass uh, Amherst Library, and it's available uh, online. So if you just Google dedication of Du Bois boyhood home, you'll see it. And in there is a little uh, segment in which uh, you recognize this, this uh, twinkle in his eye as Linda, Linda uh, mentioned at the opening statement. Um, and uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, this, this uh, uh, really understanding and, and celebrating uh, uh, legacy uh, is very much something that, that, uh, that uh, you know, he gave back to, to Du Bois, um, that, I, that I feel like that that's in, in many ways what we are, have accomplished uh, through this conference is by uh, celebrating and appreciating so many aspects of uh, of uh, education and scholarship that uh, that he has uh, 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 given to uh, to us as a community. So thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Kenji. Uh, we're going to next be uh, hearing from Pedro Noguera. Noguera. Pedro, uh, pl pleasure to see you here. Glad you made it. And uh, I mentioned that um, I, since we're this is being recorded for posterity, we want to make sure to do it in the right way by introducing you uh, more formally than uh, than might be necessary, but it, it important. Pedro Noguera is the USC uh, Emory Stoops and Joyce King Stoops Dean of the Rosaire School of Education. Prior to joining USC, he was a dis distinguished professor of education and holder of endowed chairs at. UCLA, NYU, Harvard, and the University of California, Berkeley. A, a sociologist, uh, Nogueta's research focuses on the ways in which schools are influenced by social and economic conditions, as well as by demographic trends in local, regional, and uh, global texts. He is author, co-author, and editor of 15 books. Most re his most recent book, and I'm not sure there might have been new another one here. A search for common ground, conversations about the tough questions and the complex issues confronting K-12 education in the United States. With uh, Richard Rick Hess was the winner of the American Association of Pub Publishers Prose Award in 2021. In 2014, he was elected to the National Academy of Education and Phi Delta Kappa Honor Society, and in 2020. Uh, uh, Professor Noguera was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We are so fortunate today to have Dean Noguera as a national leader in, in education, 
uh, examining uh, who has examined how educational systems can realize social justice uh, to help close our celebration of the ongoing contributions and lines of thought and action made possible by uh, Professor uh, Gordon. Pedro. Thank you, Richard. And uh, so good to see all of you, particularly you, my friend, my mentor, Ed Gordon. Uh, it's such a, a pleasure um, to be with you. And uh, I want to thank Eva and Richard for bringing us together to honor you this way. And, and you, you have mean so much to so many of us. And uh, it's such a, 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 a just, I did, my heart is full of love and admiration right now as I see you here today. So um, Kenji's done such a good job of presenting um, Ed's uh, you know, biography, intellectual biography. I'm not gonna touch that. I will start though, just by sharing this. I had the great fortune of um, meeting Ed when I first entered the um, job market. Um, he was at Yale University at the time. Um, and uh, I was uh, being considered for a position there, a joint position between sociology and Afro-American studies. Um, Dr. Gordon was the chair of the Afro-Am department. And I had dinner that evening with um, Ed and his wife, Susan. And it was such a pleasure, such warmth. Um, and, you know, Ed warned me. It, it, was, it was hardly a recruiting meeting. He kind of warned me about the issues. There were a lot of fights going on in the Afro-Am department. And he said, you know, this may not be the best place to start out. <laughs> so it wasn't really a, a much of a recruitment, I would say. It was more, I think, of a mentorship. That And, and from that very meeting, um, we began, I think, a, a relationship that has extended over many, many years. And uh, I didn't go to Yale. I ended up going to Berkeley. But I still followed and connected with uh, Dr. Gordon throughout my career. Um, also with his son, Ted, uh, who's at the University of Texas, uh, whom I first met in Nicaragua. Um, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is, Ed is trying to say something. You're on mute. Ed, I didn't hear that. I'm still we not here. still can't hear you. <laughs> I want to hear it. I want to hear it. <laughs> Turn it up. Is it work now? Now it's working. Yes. Okay. I was simply reminding Pedro that his son was with us earlier today. I know. I know. <laughs> right. Thank well, you. Here we are. Generations right. <laughs> connecting. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Well, and, you. Um, and, you know, we also connected when, when, when Ed was uh, at Teachers College. He uh, tried to convince me to come there when he was to, when he was getting ready to leave uh, to direct Yumi, and I said ah, I'm going to go to NYU instead. <laughs> but um, again, we've had I've had the the benefit of connecting with what I believe is education's true public intellectual, um, because throughout his career, um, Dr. Gordon has done work that really addresses the critical issues facing our nation, facing. Uh, particularly the children who have most historically been marginalized and denied educational opportunities. And uh, his legacy has touched so many careers. And uh, I'm, I'm certainly one of those. So <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about the future, um, uh, since that's what we were asked. And if I can, I'll share my slides. I think, Frank, yes, I said I can. And I want to talk about um, what I'm going to call the equity imperative. And, and I, I'm, I'm using that term because I believe that equity is not a fad. Equity is not um, simply a trope. Equity is, is vital to the future of this country and to the world. Uh, we know, and, and Ed's work and, and several others have shown us, that more often than not, education reproduces inequality that more often than not, it's the backgrounds of children, particularly with respect to race and class, that not only predicts how well they'll do in school, but what kinds of jobs they'll hold, how much money they'll earn, where they'll live, and, and, and whether or not they'll be able to contribute to the society we live in. And so if we have any interest at all in changing that future, 
then we have to start to think differently about education. And, and, and throughout his career, Ed has helped us to think differently about education. Uh, <clears throat> this quote from uh, Joe Staglitz at Columbia reminds us that in the United States in particular, inequality is deeply entrenched. And what that means, as he says here, is the life chances of an individual are more dependent on the income and education of their parents than in other countries. People born in the bottom are more likely to end up not being able to achieve and live up to their potential. That is the America we know right now. And so all the discussions about learning loss, the achievement gap, often miss the point, the point that Ed Gordon has made, the point that Steiglitz is making now. If America is to live up to its potential as a nation that offers opportunity, that truly judges a person based not on their race or class, but on their character and their ability and their talent, then we need an educational system that allows for that. And we don't have one now. It's ironic because as the US Supreme Court debates this question of affirmative action yet again, and in all likelihood will eliminate it, given the makeup of the court today, we've known for many years that inequity is baked into our society. Robert Putnam, the political scientist at Harvard University wrote this book, Our Kids, back in 2014. He goes back to his hometown in Ohio, a hometown that when he graduated from high school in 1964, sent 80% of the students black and white to college. He goes back in 2004 and he finds a city in shambles a city where the hopes and dreams of the residents are in, are, are, and are, are in disarray. The schools send very few kids to college. And he asks, what happened to the American dream? Why was it that in 1964, we could send so many to college and in 2004, 2014, that's not the case. What went wrong? We need to ask that because we're living at a time in this country and we see it in the anger that's growing among the white working class voters who've embraced Donald Trump and the Republican Party. And anger that's really rooted in lives that are ruined. This book by these Princeton sociologists, Deaths of Despair, documents the large numbers of Americans, white Americans, dying of opioids and of suicide, gun-inflicted suicide. Many of us have focused our work on the plight of the Black and the Latino and the Native American working class in this country. Not sufficient attention has been given to the white working class. The anger, the desperation that has now manifested itself in this backlash against progress in this country, in this embrace of this new version of conservatism. And I think that if we wanna understand what is fueling this rightward trite trend in America, we have to understand this plight, this current situation. A few years ago, one of my students was uh, doing research in Appalachia, Southern Ohio. And she shared something with me that I found very interesting. She said more Black students from the high school where she was doing her research were going to college than the white students, higher percentage. I said, really? I said, what do you, how do you explain that? She says, well, when you talk to the white students, they have given up already. They don't believe in college. And many of them don't even have access to jobs. They're stuck. When you're stuck, you become angry. You become desperate. You look for scapegoats. And we know that this scapegoating got even more aroused 
as a result of the racial justice movements following the murder of George Floyd. That is, as the country rose up during the height of the pandemic to say that police killings like this had to stop, not long after, there was the backlash. And we saw the backlash that Trump led, and that backlash is still very much alive and in force. So as we think about what role education could play, because I truly believe, like Ed Gordon, that education is one of our best hopes for the future. We have to realize that when we focus on education and, and think about how it can be used to drive mobility, to generate opportunity, that we've got to confront the issue of poverty. And poverty is not simply a black or Latino issue. It's a white issue too. And until we address that, until we address that desperation, that hopelessness, we will find ourselves not only polarized, but in a state where violence is on the increase and all of our futures are imperiled. So I wanna acknowledge the moment we're in. I would like to say that because of Dr. Gordon's work and Eva Baker's work and Richard Duran's work and Kenji's work, that things have gotten better. That's not the case. It's not the case because we have so many Americans that can't distinguish between real news and fake news. We have so many Americans who don't read, who feel threatened by something they call critical race theory and don't even know what that is. So now we're seeing books banned, we're seeing histories rewritten. This is where we are. And so the question becomes, how do we address this? What do we do? Well, as Dr. Gordon knows better than most of us, this is not the first time that we've experienced a backlash. Certainly his mentor, W.B. Du Bois knew that because he had his passport taken away. He had his right to travel denied. Why? Because during the McCarthy period, black intellectuals especially, but many white intellectuals as well, were shut down and censored for speaking out. But it's also important to realize that during the height of that movement, the height of that backlash, the civil rights movement was born. A new generation came forth. Now I'm hopeful and waiting for this new generation to come forth. I'm watching what's happening in Iran and I'm watching young women stand up to the mullahs and say, we won't wear your head scars. I haven't seen a similar response in this country from young people. Maybe they're too busy on social media, but we need it. Because if we're gonna generate some hope, we're gonna to have to understand what it's gonna to take to begin to use education as a means to change the way we think about our future and think about the problems we face. And this is why equity has gotta be at the center of our work. Most people, when they see this and you say, well, look, equity is about leveling the playing field to allow all children to participate. It's about acknowledging the differences among our children and compensating to the degree that we can. This is what Dr. Gordon's work has shown us in such vivid detail. And most people, they see that, they kind of get it. What they don't see is this. And this is what those, not, uh, well, at least the, the majority on the Supreme Court won't acknowledge. Those who have more because their parents had more money, more education are getting more and more and more. And those children who come to us needing more are getting the very least. This achievement gap that we had been fixated on since No Child Behind 
is really about a gap in opportunity. And so when we do equity work, what we're really doing is focusing on the barriers, eliminating the barriers that obstruct child development, that limit their opportunities, that render their schools useless because they lack the ability to meet their needs. And so as educators, as scholars, who are following the tradition of the great Ed Gordon, we've got to then do the work of helping people to understand what needs to be done to really advance equity. That's a winning strategy, not just for people of color, but for white people too. When I used to travel the country and I would speak in the red states and in rural areas, I would tell them equity's for you too. I remember speaking to a congressman, a Republican congressman from Erie, Pennsylvania, who told me his son had dropped out of school and couldn't find a job. And he was trying to understand why there were so many young people like him. And I would say it's because we have come to accept as normal that which is unacceptable. And Dr. Gordon's work reminds us that this is not about lowering standards. This is not about making excuses. This is about elevating education in a way that cultivates agency in children, that fosters deeper learning that Linda darling Hammond is so capably written about, building their social capital, and <clears throat> ensuring that the educators who serve them are equipped to do so well. So as we think about the legacy of dear Dr. Ed Gordon. Let's also think about this, that despite the problems we face, not just in this country, but across the world, where are beacons of hope that are showing us what the future could be like? This school in Philadelphia where young women at a very early age are doing computer science shows us that when we provide educational opportunities at a young age to children that challenges and stimulates, education can in fact serve as a means to counter poverty. When we tap into the natural talents and abilities of children, we can in fact use education to not only provide literacy, but media literacy and to cultivate their voices so that they can participate fully in this democracy that is imperiled now. A few years ago, you New Yorkers may know this, uh, <clears throat> story got a lot of attention. This little boy, Tani Aduumi, who was homeless and became a national chess champion. They featured him on, several, uh, on 60 Minutes and, and, and he became highly celebrated. My question to you is how many more children like this are languishing in our schools, lacking the stimulation? Because we haven't figured out how to reach them, how to use education as a means to expand opportunity and expand horizons. Ed Gornitz has shown us, Ed has shown us through our work that we can build alliances across our differences to create a different reality for the future. This is the hope in Ed Gordon's work. And this is the work that we've got to commit ourselves to if we wanna create a future that is more promising and more hopeful. 2008, we elected an African-American president. Many of us thought we were on the verge of a new America. 2016, we elected Donald Trump. Change can happen quickly, can't it? It doesn't mean it won't continue to change. And we can't allow the moment we're in to allow us to give up. 
So I want to leave you with this. Dr. King reminded us that we're all in this together. Dr. Gordon has reminded us through his work that when we use education as a means to cultivate human potential, we can generate a sense of hope and possibility for the future. So Ed Gordon, I wanna thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you personally for what you've done for me. Thank you on behalf of the thousands of others that you have led and mentored and inspired through your example and through your work. I just say it's an honor to say I count myself among the many who've benefited from your mentorship and from your guidance. Thank you. Very stirring, uh, Dean Noguera. Thank you kindly for these closing remarks. It's been so marvelous to think about the future, building on the hope from the past and its realization. And thank you, Kenji, for taking us back into the historical roots of the career and contributions of Professor Gordon and then having a, a Dean Noguera follow with the, the promise and the hope that, that is built upon the foundations in the past that endear and overcome. Thank you. And uh, so, uh, Professor Gordon, it's your turn to, uh, to offer comments and commentary to share with us. Please go ahead. How much, how much uh, time do I have left? Oh, yeah. 15 as much as you hour. Want. What did you say? I said as much as you want. Oh, okay. I well, don't I'm... think we'll cut you off. <laughs> you, you have to be careful about that. I'm a <laughs> pre preacher, you know, and we preachers <laughs> like to hog the pulpit. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you both very much. I am really quite moved. Uh, not only is it an, just an excellent conference, but you've hit on so many of the notes that uh, uh, I'm proud of. I. I think it was Kenji who was talking about my reference to the boys as not being very modest. Uh, listening to you review what people think about me and the things I've tried to do, I have to say, I, I've, I've done pretty good. I rather put it as having been blessed. I often refer to the fact that I was birthed by, I was blessed by uh, conception. And I was blessed by uh, a, a loving family that had the good fortune of being well resourced and uh, understanding enough of the needs of young black children as to provide for my sister and me just excellent uh, opportunities. They also knew failure. We had a older brother who was a mental retardant. Incidentally, that relationship to Charlie White that uh, Kenji uh, mentioned uh, Richard probably developed because Charlie was an only child. I was uh, one of three, one of whom was retarded and a sister with whom I was very close, but I never had a brother until I, I, I met Charlie and we uh, took to each other. But I don't want to talk too much about the personal social side of my background, I want to turn more to the ideas I've been pushing for 75 or 80 years now. My colleagues 
have helped me put together some notes. And they'll forgive me if I don't use all of them, uh, but I'll try not to talk too long either. The experience of uh, thinking out loud in the presence of highly competent colleagues who have been one's students and one's advisors and then one's critics is at one and the same time a privilege and it's a challenge. It is also an inspiration. I must say I shared with Eva that I didn't look forward to speaking at the end or at any time because particularly as I've gotten older, I feel less confident about uh, my delivery of uh, my ideas. You might find me reading some sections of this, but I really prefer the talk uh, extemporaneously, so I often leave my notes. But to have this opportunity to hear you talk about me at the beginning of the first decade of one second century of living. That's a remarkable pleasure. And I must say in the past two days, I've sat here with tears in my eyes, uh, so moved at some of the things I've heard you say. But it is a opportunity for me to say thank you to a lot of people. If I were to thank the list that my colleagues have listed here for me to thank uh, my 15 or 20 or minutes would be uh, used up just saying thank you. But I must say thank you to you, Eva, to you, uh, Richard, and to you, Kenji. When I knew Kenji originally, when we were colleagues at uh, Yale, I didn't even know he uh, had paid much attention to uh, my presence there. It was some years later that I learned that I had, in a sense, uh, helped to make his career at Yale. He, as he told you, took from me the seeds of interest in, in, in pedagogy. And for those of you who don't know it, he is one of the elder statespersons now of uh, education policy. One of the people who's listened to as we look for help and guidance. But let me talk specifically from my notes. It was over the past 10 years, I guess now, I've been reading and thinking a lot about what I call the repurposing of assessment, the repurposing of assessment. When I was uh, tapped to head the Gordon Commission on the future of assessment, and I shouldn't really call it tapped, I had proposed the idea to the trustees down at ETS and they were wise or silly enough to put up a lot of money for me to convene a group of scholars from across the country who were experts in uh, educational assessment, some uh, for their expertise in pedagogy in general. I was at that time uh, quietly criticized for some, by some people um, who knew that I didn't know anything about me measurement, wondered why I'd been put in that position. 
but I was able with that group of people to get them to agree on an idea that I'm gonna tell you in a few minutes that was not a new idea for me. We agreed that the purpose of assessment ought to be, could be, can be to inform and improve learning. It wasn't that we were backing away from the responsibility of assessment to measure, but somehow we came to agree that in the course of measuring, in the course of documenting performances and making judgments about them, there were some other things that we were doing and some other values that the field held that could be informative of learning, that could improve learning. Now, I'm embarrassed to tell you that even though I surfaced that notion to the commission in 2011, I think it was, I had learned it 65 years before. It was in 1955, and Linda told you something about this in her uh, talk, and I think Kenji mentioned it. In 1955, my first job in psychology had been to help a teacher, a special education teacher, who headed uh, education services in a pediatrics clinic. And she felt that she wanted help, not so much with measuring and classifying her kids. She wanted help in understanding them, understanding the way in which they, uh, uh, they, they, they functioned. And it was out of my work with Elsa that I got the notion that the process of observing, studying, measuring folk ought to also and could be used uh, to develop them. One of the criticisms of my uh, Gordon Commission was that we had not created a blueprint. I've taken that criticism kind of seriously and I think I deserved to be criticized even more. I kind of think that if we lived in a really just world that held us academics accountable for what we do, I and a lot of people who know more about assessment than I know, would actually be indicted for malpractice. I think we know how, or certainly we know enough to figure out how to use what we can determine from our analyses of the functioning, the performances of learners on our tests. We know enough about that process to be investing far more in what we call formative assessment than we do. My criticism of formative assessment is that we stay rather close to our measures of developed ability. We focus too sharply on the status of kids and use that status those status data to inform our interventions, to inform the level at which we place. Too often we predict who will uh, uh, make it and use those predictions to re record people. In one of my books, I think it's the affirmative development book. One of my students and I, uh, 
Moreau is her last name. Audrey, Andrea Moreau helped me write a little essay on the undemocratic nature of meritocracy. What we argue there is that while we think of meritocracy, meritocratic approaches to the distribution of opportunity, we think of that as a democratizing force, but it is basically another way of rewarding the people who've had the kind of opportunities that enable success. The same instruments, the same processes that we use to identify those outliers, those uh, highly successful people, could also be used if we were to follow my uh, friend, Ms. Ms. Heusemann, could also be used to determine the conditions under which kids were failing, just as we can understand the conditions under which they succeed, the correlates of success and failure, and use that in understanding, use that in understanding to design, design in implementations to provide, to design treatments that will serve to develop. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that that's gonna solve all of the problems, but I have long thought that under the influence of uh, our friend, heroes, Kronbach and Snow, two very able of our, our scholars, I think when they concluded that there was not much promise in treat, treatment interaction, some awfully good people backed away from that. I remember our friends, Bob Glazer, John Flanagan, two or three other people were very heavy into individualized instruction. And because we couldn't manage the vast amount of data that were needed in order to implement that kind of work. And I think because uh, Dick and uh, uh, Lee had concluded that the available research wasn't paying off very much, we backed away from that. In my book in 1960 something on human diversity and pedagogy, the last chapter, I criticize not so much them, but the field at that time. I think they were doing the best that they could with the data that they had, but they misinterpreted. If you go back and look at those data, they were largely trait treatment interactions, individual traits, individual treatments. And the question was, if you match those, does it make a difference? And it didn't make much difference. So consider for a moment what most of us do in learning situations. I know when I've got something to learn, I bring everything I've got. The more important it is, the more I bring, to try to see what I've got in my toolkit will help me learn it. And if I get into good teaching situations, my good teachers, my good tutors use everything they've got to try to help me learn it. Now, if you're gonna take just my style or just my speed or just my interest and look at one treatment of that, it's not surprising that we don't get any uh, 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 result. But we know from practice, if you go and look at some of the work I did on what I called the fires of negative prediction, we see that most successful people attribute their success to all manner of things that they have orchestrated to work for them. Because most of us are challenged by problems. 
most of us have to work at solving problems. There are few geniuses around, but most of us, you know, kind of plot at it. And we use whatever we've got to try to solve the problems we've got. Now, the reason I'm a little bit embarrassed about my coming to the same point 65 years later is that this is what Ms. Hoiseman was doing with her developmentally uh, challenged uh, kids. She would take these three, four, five, eight page reports that we generated on children that describe the conditions under which they uh, could uh, uh, adapt, the kinds of circumstances that uh, tended to threaten them, the context in which they succeeded, the scaffolds that help, uh, would help them work to help them learn. I knew how to do that in 1955, certainly 57, when uh, we uh, published uh, Horseman's books, book on the subject. But you know, I got distracted. I got distracted by an invitation to be the chairperson of the guidance department at uh, Columbia University. I looked over into uh, the, this other, the lawn, the lawn, L-A-W-N, of uh, Columbia as opposed to Yeshiva and thought it was greener. If you, those of you who go back that how long will know that we were very much enamored, enamored with the potential of uh, psychoanalytic uh, therapy. Of, we were very much concerned with mental health issues. And I fear that the developmentally uh, challenged folk were viewed negatively then just as they are now. I stopped the work I was doing with Ms. Oiseman to work on guidance, to work on mental, mental health. And I suppose I made some lives better. My wife and I created a clinic in uh, Harlem that worried about the lives of children. And I suppose we did some good there. But I'm embarrassed over the last 10 years that I have returned to a problem that I gave up 60 years ago. And maybe if I had invested 60 years in it, uh, we'd be further along now. Because after 10 years of thinking about the problem now, I've begun to rethink what I think pedagogy is about. 10, 15 years ago, I was talking about a pedagogical triarcha, the three pillows or legs of pedagogy, assessment, teaching and learning. And even at the time of the uh, uh, Gordon Commission, I was thinking about, about the future of that assessment function. After worrying about these matters for uh, the last 10 or 15 years, I'm beginning to think that maybe In addition to, or maybe even instead of repurposing assessment, you know, I've been talking about repurposing assessment to better serve learning. It may be that assessment isn't intended, isn't designed to serve learning, except as we have thought that we might advance it by using it to hold us learners and their teachers uh, accountable, but you know, 20 years of no child left behind uh, hasn't helped very much with that. If you go back to what Horseman was te teaching me how to do, to do that kind of work instead of measuring, instead of assessing, 
we are really analyzing. My notion with respect to measurement or assessment is that it is an effort at determining status, uh, quantity, uh, goodness. What do you know, what methodology do we need if the question is to understand? What is the vehicle by which we use research to understand the processes, the, to use uh, uh, Ken Gergen's notion, the relations between the processes by which people develop, by which people learn. I'm borrowing it now from uh, cybernetics. We've got folk over there talking about learning analytics. I spent three years uh, talking off and on with uh, one of the leaders of that field. And we finally gave up because he said, Ed, I could help you with method but you, you education people have to tell us what the data, data points are to which we would apply an analytic method. He agreed that the big data focus, that is if you've got enough data points, big enough data to search for patterns <clears throat> patterns in that data that is probably more uh, productive than regression analyses. But until we who do education know what it is about education, what are the processes of learning, of teaching and learning that we think account for things, looking for the patterns between them, uh, won't, won't, won't get very far. So where I am in this beginning of my second century, I'm advocating for something I call pedagogical analytics, pedagogical analytics, primarily to both not get confused with my cybernetic friends who uh, use the label uh, learning analytics. But my friend uh, Ella Th Elena Thomas applauded my choice of pedagogy for another reason. She says, Ed, your choice of pedagogy permits you now to use those three categories of processes that you've been talking about, the assessment one, the teaching one, the learning one, and it is the relations between these processes, the anal analysis of the ways in which these uh, uh, processes dialectically interact that you are hoping to find some light. Let me go back to my manuscript here. Pedagogy is an organic and dialectical system of processes by which we assess, we teach, and we learn. Now, since my rich experience with the Gordon Commission on the Future of Assessment, I've added this fourth process that I'll call pedagogical analytics. We measure to determine quantity. We analyze in the pursuit of understanding, the understanding that is necessary to achieve this new purpose that my commission is advocating for, that purpose being to inform, to improve, and to improve learning and teaching. What is this pedagogical analytics? It's basically trying to make sense out of what is working for 
uh, working against persons and learning situations. The, it is not their status. It is not so much an analysis of the component parts of the process. It's analysis of the ways in which these parts work together or fail to work together. Understanding what is happening in these very dynamic and dialectically relational interacting parts. Rather than taking focus on the measurement of status, rather than trying to document as specifically as we can the status of one's ability, what has been achieved, the focus of pedagogical uh, analytics is understanding these relational transactions because it is in the manipulation of these transactions that we are likely to have our best chance at informing and improving learning. Ms. Hoiseman taught me a pedagogical value from which I have never been able to move very far away. For pedagogy, she taught me, it is far more important that measurement inform and improve learning than that it, than that it enable the determination of the status of the developed ability. It's not that determining uh, status is unimportant. It's just that it's not as important as informing the development ability. Because if we don't learn how to develop the ability, there'll be no achievement to measure. Thank you, friends, for honoring me these past two days. And even more, thank you for giving me an opportunity to work in a field that has captured my interest and my, some of my ability, but it's also given me a chance to do what I first learned from my mom and pop. If you can help, you do help. If you know, you use it to help other people. Thank you for helping me learn how to learn, how to help other people learn. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Professor, for your comments. Um, I'm a little sorry that you posed all those questions right now. I think we might have liked it. It, it does set up our next conference, however, for so that yeah, we let's might do the, go, yeah, let's we'll, do this we'll, again. We'll be on it. Um, but as usual, um, you were astonishing. Kenji, you were uh, captivating and uh, Pedro was wonderful. And I'm very happy um, with this very concluding session. Um, I have a couple of closing comments um, that I'm making on behalf of Richard and myself now that we have really reached the end of the conference. Um, Richard Duran and I worked hard, even though that sounds a little self-congratulatory, to invite the stellar group of presenters whose work partially reflected your work, Professor, in order to honor and extend your prodigious contributions. Let me say that every single person we asked accepted our invitation immediately. There were no regrets, so to speak. And moreover, each noted they were honored to be asked. 
Um, I think we have sampled from the many who see themselves as part of your extended family, a wonderful set of practitioners and scholars. And we have been, uh, as you noted, a multi-generational meeting having um, with sons and grandsons as speakers and our own academic children uh, uh, contributing as well. So my question to you and Kenji and, um, and to the audience is how can we sustain the engagement that we've had over these two days, because I found it quite unusual uh, for you know, the, the usual kind of conference that one has. And, and virtual con conferences are very difficult, at, as you know. Um, we have a few uh, minor ideas, but we'll want to follow up on this. Uh, first of all, we are, um, because the sessions have been recorded, they're going to be, the videos will be edited and they'll be made available on YouTube. So I think it's YouTube uh, UCLA Crest with two S's, uh, which, and I, I can send that note to you. And also to um, when it, the editing is done on our website, at, which is the usual HTTPS uh, colon slash slash uh, crest2s.org. Um, we are also considering, which we have talked about in the seminar, if you, if you recall, um, uh, opportunity for follow-on sessions or webinars that investigate particular aspects that were very interesting. Um, Today, the people in the learning group wanted to know what the people in the assessment group would say. And they were quite uh, uh, contiguous in a lot of ways, uh, although, you know, have slightly different foci. I mean, that in itself might, given your interest, might be an, a, a, a good way to, uh, to move on from this particular environment. And um, I'm, asking any of the people who are in the audience, and we may follow up with emails to those who registered, um, if they have ideas, they certainly can write to me at eva at ucla.edu. I think I have the shortest um, email around. That's eva at ucla.edu. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get back to you because I think with our colleagues in the seminar and um, our precedent of being able to do this, although um, with help, but not, uh, not multi hundreds of thousands of dollars of support, um, we might be able to find a way to follow on. Um, finally, uh, Richard and I ha have enormous thanks to go to Joanne Michouye, uh, Frank Messer, Cara Schlosser, Cara, I should have said, and Law Casey, who made this complex effort happen by literally working night and day um, and uh, did it in a way that made this uh, conference as seamless as any that I have seen. Um, I also want to thank uh, Director Lee Sai, the Crest Director, uh, who uh, gave us in-kind support, uh, staff time, essentially, and Dean Tina Christie, who spoke at the first session uh, quite eloquently, I thought, for her financial support. Again, we want to thank all our collaborators because they, I, as I said informally, I think everybody took a big step up and tried to do their very, very best in order to show the care and, um, and concern they have for you, Professor. And um, all of the 
collaborators, and those of you who are in the audience who joined to celebrate the remarkable Edmund W. Gordon, who, as I have said many times, is always the youngest person in the room, uh, even if it's a virtual room. So thank you again for your contribution. Thank you, Professor Gordon. Thank you, Kenji, and all the speakers, because I think this uh, exceeded our, our highest aspirations. And it's really due to the people and your tight relationships with many of them that, um, that had your family come together and celebrate. So thank you all. Uh, we'll be back and we'll be in touch soon.